I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. Um, I'm still at the Bible Museum uh, recording today, and, and you never know who you might run into. We're just wandering around the halls of a Bible Museum, but I found our little baby sister, Phyllis, Jace, here well, in I'll Washington, be. D.C., you That's a good knows. time when you're bumping into people in the Bible Museum family. <laughs> That's right. So we, so I invited her on the podcast. Back home, welcome, Phyllis. Hello. Glad to have you back. Yeah. So, uh, Dad, you're you're still alone. What what are you doing down there? You just reading the Bible and well, we're fulfilling. A uh, we're we are admonished to to obey the scriptures. All scriptures God breathe. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may mm-hmm. be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you have yeah. that. And then you check in the book of Acts, and I have proof. Uh-oh, Phil we, brought a prop. Uh-oh. We have. Oh. 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 Okay, we got props. They've We're struck. fulfilling Bible text. A lot of you are missing this, but you need to get going. Uh, It was noon the following day where these scriptures came from. They were approaching the city. city. Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, all of us do, and he wanted something to eat. Well, well, you know, while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. Here comes a giant movie screen, ladies and gentlemen. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals. That's Mm -hmm. one. Buffalo, horses, cattle, deer. Deer. As well as reptiles of the earth. Oh, my goodness. And here come the birds, the birds of the air. We got orders from headquarters. A voice told him from heaven now, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter tried to renege. And God says, hey, hey, Peter said, oh, oh I can't do that. You know, what I mean, I, you know, I love animals. You know, I, I'm for animal rights, so I can't do that. God said, hey, uh, don't you call anything impure that I've made clean. Whack them and stack them. Orders from headquarters. That's what I'm okay. saying here. So who knew yeah. that Peter was the beginning of PETA? <laughs> I never knew that, Dad. I'm, you, that's you why I'm, I'm enlightening our fans <laughs> to look and say, huh, I got to get out there and start killing something. This, some of this stuff. All right, there's Arise, two points here. kill, and eat. It's pretty simple. Wait there's, a minute, Jace. Before you make the point, Dad has once again provided a first in podcast history, I'm sure. I don't know this for sure, but he has brought dead ducks onto the set. <laughs> of a podcast okay, I think that that's was a part. that was the first point that for you oh, okay. who are just listening phil <laughs> held up most of the time it looked like a uh quite a few dead blue wing teal that they had shot i guess this morning because they they didn't look like rigor mortis had set in <laughs> These are, and he will clean those. He's bringing, back. Hour ago, these, He's bringing them back for our audience. Now y'all look Phil, at this. We I, get I want it. All They're back folks, up. All you folks to turn on. I want you to remember something. These probably came out of either North the Prairies on North or South Dakota, possibly the Canadian wetlands, the the, the rolling plains. Up there this the is now part. called the autopsy. <laughs> yep. They migrated. They migrated all the way down, and we were here yeah. waiting for them. And uh, it is biblical to the core. He's happy for duck season. Well, for a duck the, man, all you need is to start killing ducks, and then you get happy, happy, happy. happy. I'm showing Jace. I want to yeah, Jace. You're rubbing it in. I, yeah. I get it. This is all. Of, this is personal. This has nothing to do with the podcast. This was you were in Nashville, and this is what we did while you were gone. He's holding them He's up again. Holding them up again. Jace is running around it. in Rocky Top. Too much rock. Too much top. But out right here. We're shooting ducks while he's up there trying to trying to survive. <laughs> People are stealing yeah. trucks out of their yard and running off with them. You That's know, true. last couple of weeks. That's true. <laughs> Phil's down in Nashville. I got it. It's it's a dangerous place. I got sick while I was here. I've developed a cold. But 
the second point I was going to make is when Phil was reading that, he was interjecting that from the Phil translation because half of that was scripture and half of it was Phil's conjecture in the middle. Just so when you read that and wonder where the Peter <laughs> reference was for Peter, there was a few other paraphrases in there. There's Jace, no I know you. Jace, yeah. to our audience, Jace is a little heartbroken because he didn't get into this action down there this morning. Tomorrow, Jace, yep. right. we're, moving, we're moving from where we were today, the dog, the dog bayou. That's where we hunted. We're going to move north, Jace, to the island, the little lake with the island. We think that's where the, most of the teal are going to be. So you'll be here tomorrow. Be with us. Welcome yeah. aboard, son. <laughs> well, what you don't know is while y'all were hunting, Jay called me and said, we we killed a few, but we think we would have killed a few more if we'd have moved to the lake. What do you think? And I said, I think we should go. But he said it was difficult to get to. Yep. It's give, we'll make it. So, Jace, describe it. So, you finally got into your, uh, looks like you got into your vault. Give us a, for those watching, uh, give us a little uh, about your background there. So you got some interesting looking things behind you there. Yeah, Tell the guy, it. the guy who owned this place before me, he was a treasure hunter, ironically. And he built a vault tucked away somewhere under the garage that's hard to enter. It, it literally has a vault door, like like a bank vault, mm -hmm. and it's actually tornado proof. So uh, Missy and the kids spent a night in here, one night during storms. So uh, I thought that was interesting. What what are the odds that the guy before me was a treasure hunter, and evidently he had quite the spread. So this is where he he hid all his treasures. I've looked around. I didn't I didn't find anything that he had left in the cracks however it was decorated by my lovely wife and son cole and cole did all the you know the computer technology stuff we were going to try this yesterday but the actual wi-fi streamer crashed the company that provides it so they're back up running again today so missy brought in a uh this was mia's donation you know because mia is in biology i think she's going to be a doctor or a surgeon that's what she's in college for mm. so she donated her friend the skeleton to the calls does he have a name uh, is it skeletor or well maybe the Bones? unashamed nation can there name him here's what's funny is that missy has like different outfits for the skeleton <laughs> so she was gonna put like uh I don't know what you call this stuff, like jewelry and a and a hat. And I said, What are you doing that? And she said, Well, y'all could talk about the queen, you know, she just died. I was like, and the Ooh. son my son said because <laughs> she's a big fan of the queen and yeah. uh and who was you know, she was a believer. She was telling us all the history. I said, I think that's a little early, you know, for a <laughs> skeleton. That yeah, it was too soon. I said, too I soon. don't, I don't think that's a, a good look, babe. And so they, they talked her out of doing that. So she went with the shirt that uh, the people had sent in when, when I had the Holy Spirit moved and gave me the idea about Jesus. He's better because there's no skeleton in the grave or in his closet. Yeah. So we put that shirt on him. She didn't yeah. want me to be lonely here. See, she just left, and I'm in a bunker. It's kind of lonely and eerie down here. <laughs> so that's the story with the Mr. Bones. I'm not sure what this – they told me that this contraption was something my son Reed made, and it cools the CPUs on the computer. Mm. Mm. So, Dad, Dad, do you need help cooling your CPUs? <laughs> You know, I'm living in a I'm living in a period of time to where at least half of it I'm sitting there saying, What? <laughs> so then we have the American flag, we have a bow. Uh I could have have shot several deer. I could hang them up this morning, but it's not deer season yet. But they're they don't do walking that. in my yard nonstop. 
And they so don't do you seem... usually bow hunt for deer? No, but I probably will here because they're in they're in my yard, and I have neighbors, so this all happens. You're be firing early. off any any guns. Well, I yeah. just don't want to wake them up, I guess, with a gun blast. So uh, I mean, this is. Mm-hmm. I got up and walked outside because I just wanted to see their reaction, and they just looked at me and just went right back to eating. So I think they were <laughs> they thought I was part of the forest, Phil. <laughs> yeah, some guy <laughs> researched it. Research it the other day, and uh, I think he said it was 60 million buffalo here about the time Columbus ran the boat aground and they started looking at the Americas. 60 million buffalo, they were all passing gas daily, but it had no, no, no damage to the planet that they know of. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's quite a factoid. <laughs> Little carbon alert from Phil. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Lots of gas was being passed, and it wasn't burning up the planet. Well, Phil, if you look in my yard, they're, they're doing at more a few than cows just pass- now and saying, "Well, these cows are doing it." You know, the cows are passing gas. It's going to ruin it. I said, "Well, the buffalo way more than the cattle. We had plenty of buffalo run around, and no effect." It was pristine, beautiful. When man got That's a funny. hold of it, the the worst thing you could ever do is take about half of it and put a bunch of mirrors up or big spinning wheels that's killing birds. And I mean, it's just crazy. Well, they're talking yeah. about Phil vax- bringing in all the wild animals and giving them a shot for the coronavirus. Yeah. Yep. So I, I guess now we need to also do something about so they can have some kind of sewage system, but I'm not sure how you're going to convince them to go into a stall. So, Dad, as you know, we have 360 joints uh, from your neck down your vertebrae, back, arms, all the way down to your feet. Uh, As you sit here today, do you have any aches and pains? Zero. Zero. I'm being 100, 100% honest, no aches and pains, none. And you're the oldest of our crew here, so one of the reasons why, there's no doubt about it, is that you take Omega XL, as do I. Uh, it really helps us to be able to help our joints to be healthy. When you're young, your bodies produce SPMs, and that's nature's way of keeping your joints healthy. We get a little bit older, we don't have so many SPMs, that's why we have pain, we have these aches in our joints. So Omega XL helps rejuvenate joints and muscles so that you can move around like you were when you were younger. So we want you to check them out. Go to OmegaXL.com slash fill. You're going to buy a bottle. You're going to get a second bottle for free. And so it's going to give you about a two-month supply, which is when these things really kick in. Uh, and then you're going to want to take them from now. It's a great supplement. OmegaXL.com slash fill. Or you can call them at 800-844-4888. That's 800-844-4888 or OmegaXL.com slash fill. But what, what's it? But why is it? Would you? Because like there was a country that just outlawed. I don't want to name it because I'm not sure which one it was. But one of the Scandinavian countries outlawed ads for meat over this issue dad brought up and i thought well that's correct shouldn't we be eating more of them like we should be eating more like if we're wanting to like have less shouldn't we be eating more of them or does somehow that transfer to our gas i'm not understanding the let's don't eat it and yet that's somehow going to make them provide less gas that i'm not making the linkage on the logic is I mean, does that make sense to y'all? I, I don't. I Cause don't people, get it. Because if you don't eat them, people won't farm them. As I, guess, I guess that's what they're saying. They won't. So grow they're them, saying then they'll just disappear. It'll reduce okay, breeding. I and- yeah, but I you know, we just but, eat. But, truth, but truthfully, like even in the U.S., like there's a good shot. I would say there's probably a fifty-fifty chance that this video will will probably be throttled just because Phil showed the the ducks. You remember the time Phil you you cleaned the duck on Facebook? Uh, we had a Facebook video and and you. Uh, I was, I was accused of being a violent man when I was picking some of these ducks. But yeah. but but if you're going to have like fried chicken, I, they taste a lot better when the feathers are off of them than trying to eat the feathers. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got to take Somebody. the feathers off of them. 
Somebody's got to get violence. That's, that's that, uh, that, that guy, what's his name? Head of Facebook, what's his, what they call him, Mark? Uh, Zuckerberg. 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 Yeah. Zuckerberg. Yeah. Yeah, that's that word. Who's who's not not really a person? He's an android. Let's uh let's take a break. So anyway, so we're back to we got our four locations today. So this is kind of exciting. Uh, we had a few bumps on the last podcast, but hopefully we'll land the plane. So uh, Phyllis got to uh, tour uh, the Bob Museum yesterday. What'd you think about it? So good, so much fun. Um, it's really immersive, and it's really. There's a lot of technology, so it's new. It's fun. It's not like a stuffy old like museum. It's not boring. Right. So I thought that was really cool. And um, one of the things that I thought, Dad, you might be interested to know is they had a whole section set up with a timer. And it had calendars, different calendars from different time periods. I've wondered about that. And a timer that showed like how many years, how many months, how many days, hours, minutes, and seconds since the birth of Jesus. And then you could go up to a machine, a kiosk type thing, and type in your, uh, put your name in and put your birth date in, and it would spit out a bookmark for you. So I did one for you, and it says Phil Robertson was born 1,944 years, three months, and as of today, 30 days after the birth of Jesus. Huh. So there's you, a, a bookmark from the Museum of the Bible, and it's got some type of... Uh, I think that might be Greek uh, calendar on the back, but I got one. I got one for you. I got one for Miss Kay. Uh, I know she loves to read, but it it talks about how uh, you know what AD stands for, so it's educational, and uh, and it goes into one of your main points that you like to make when you're sharing the gospel is that we are counting time by Jesus yep. uh, all over the world, and so they had a whole display about that, and I thought that was that was pretty cool. Um. The we had a tour guide and he was great and he made it more interesting. But we were um, going through there and he said that and this is what was really cool. A lot of this stuff kind of builds your faith um, and and it strengthens the story of the Bible and provides like historical evidence of the Bible being true and the story of Jesus being true. So uh, for Christians and Jews or even seekers. It's really informational to come here. But the guy was saying that even like on a yearly basis, they're making new discoveries, archaeological uh, discoveries that are supporting our faith, which is really cool. And they found uh, about a year. Well, it's been it's just now open, but it's this banquet hall that they found um, and you can tour it now. But they can show by uh, science and carbon dating that it was built at about the year AD 20. And they can show that it was damaged by an earthquake and get this in the year AD 33. A big earthquake happened. 8.6 mm. on the Richter scale <clears throat> is what they are able to, to prove. And, and if you look at that and you know and you believe the Bible, well, then you know that there was a big earthquake on the day of Christ's crucifixion. And, uh, yep. and there's this banquet hall on the Temple of the Mount area. So that was pretty cool. And, and they have a whole replica of like the whole book of Isaiah that was found in uh, old caves over in Israel, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls um, with prophecy in it. Just super cool stuff. It was really, really educational. It was interesting. It was modern. Um, it's a really fun experience. We haven't even seen it all. Um, it could take, I guess it could probably take you a few days if you really wanted to see all of it. So that was fun that we get to, yeah, that Phil's and Tony got cool to come along there. To, yeah. mm -hmm. to experience it. It was interesting though, Dad, because you say all the time, how many years has it been since mm -hmm. Jesus was here? And they literally have a counter. I'm saying uh, who, clock it, the, if, you're, if you're living your life, and time is predicated on one individual, I would at least investigate him to see why. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. give me a break. So we hadn't had Phyllis on the podcast in a while. Phyllis and Tony have a grandbaby. Uh, Jason and Phyllis share that um, pretty close together, your, your first grandchildren, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. How's that being awesome? Oh, my goodness. I love being a grandparent. Mm -hmm. And he's just a sink and adorable. He's six months old now. Uh, and a, just a, an absolute miracle. Um, uh, I don't know if we've shared really much of, have we talked about any much of his story? No, here? And, uh, to tell that he, when, before he was born, um, they thought he had uh, water on his, uh, yeah, they brain. actually said that, um, part of his brain wasn't formed, just wasn't there. And, um, so we, you know, the kids were devastated. They called us and then, uh, they found that he had water on his brain 
So he, he was dealing with that and they were thinking they may have to deliver him early and do brain surgery. It was, um, pretty, it was pretty much a bleak um, prediction. Very much. So they said he would at least be blind, if not severely developmentally disabled. And so um, long story short, he was, he was, uh, they did one final scan. They were doing scans every week to monitor that fluid buildup. And they did his last scan on Friday, saw fluid. Um, he was born on Monday. And then when they, the, the nurse practitioner came around to check on everybody after uh, Julie had had the baby and uh, just checking in, seeing how you're doing, everything going okay with the baby. And we're like, okay, what about the scans? You know, how about his brain? And she said, well, well what do you mean? Everything's fine. <laughs> and we said, well, wait a minute. You said that, well, she didn't say several doctors and many, many, many technicians before her had said that he didn't have part of his brain and he had fluid on his brain. And she said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with his brain. It's all there. And, uh, uh, he had no indication that, that there was any vision problems at all. And, uh, the and one thing that they said now, was right? an issue. Um, I, they said part of it was like a thin area of his brain because of the fluid that had been there. And when we met with Dr. Ben Carson, I actually talked about it with him and asked him about it. And he said, that's uh, normal if there's been fluid on the brain and that will resolve itself. So he's had zero developmental disability issues. He's meeting all of his milestones, perfectly healthy super sweet disposition. It's just a great baby. So, and, and Mo, by the way, we've been praying about it since the minute we heard it. So. Absolutely. Yep. God we'll healed get, him. I we'll mean, he, praise to God on that one. God healed him. Absolutely. He's a miracle. Which is a blessing. So I guess dad, we talked about, you know, four of your five children are grandparents now and uh, which makes you a great grandparent to the, to the highest degree. So how does that make you feel? Well, it's a, it's a good feeling because so far, I have zero aches and pains, and it's it's been very nice of God to let me observe the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren. So uh, it's quite quite the quite the uh, the story. Just to watch how your family starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. If you so live we're long gonna, enough we're, to see it, which he's allowed. So that, we're going to so. get to we're going to get to Mark in just a minute. But I want to ask one more question since we had Phyllis on, Dad. So it's been almost three years now since we found out about Phyllis, or actually she found us, and so she's been living next door to you, she and Tony, for the last two years. So what did, what's your how's that been? I mean, I'm sure our audience is wondering uh, how's that been for you to have your daughter that you didn't know you had uh, living next door to you for the last two years. Well, if you say, if you look at it by saying for 45 years, I knew nothing of this. And all of a sudden she appears. Uh, I think it's been pretty cool. What do you think, Phyllis, living right next to me? We come down and we all eat together. And she she mm -hmm. puts these, uh, 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 what would you call it? She she fixes meals that are, that are not as fattening as other meals, you know. <laughs> She eats healthy like. So that was a, <laughs> that was a strange thing. That was a shock. What, what's, what's the word for that? What's the word? What's the healthy. word? I'm really proud to be the one to say that I introduced Phil Robertson to kale. <laughs> That's oh, right. Really? Yeah, and he's had it. some vegetarian uh, dishes that he's enjoyed that he and Miss Kay have loved. And uh, he, 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 we eat meat, but we have, we eat a lot of uh, plant-based meals, a lot of, a lot less processed food. Uh, we've been very intentional about that and doing a really good job. And, uh, so yeah, so he likes this, uh, kale salad that we make that has uh, pumpkin seeds and other seeds and greens in it and vegetables. And yeah, we make it pretty often and yeah. other, other dishes. Yeah. Cause we were cooking for him after Miss K hurt her hand. We started and we're right next door. So we were bringing some meals down. So, uh, I, you know, we've helped bring some meals. I've done some nursing wound care. It's kind of been my role lately. Yeah. The well, first the first phase of that, Al, was when Phyllis would have something she brought down and she's cooking it, I would look over in there. So for about six months, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm looking in the pot and I can't identify what it is. And she would explain to me and I thought, well, let's give her a whirl and see what happens. Well, I think with mom's uh, <clears throat> current rate of uh, – 
injuries, it was it was great to have a sister we found that happened to specialize in wound care as a nurse. Yep. So I think God provided a, a great thing. So from my perspective, it's been great having Tony and Phyllis and their family uh, in our lives. So I know a lot of you have been interested about that. I get notes every once in a while asking about Phyllis. And so life is good, right? Life I mean, is good. Yeah. And uh, I, I just started. Uh, uh, so a life update, too, is that I'm now in a master's program at Liberty University Online. So I'm uh, taking a career path change to be a licensed professional counselor. Oh, wow. That's so something we Liberty need more. has a great Especially program. For Jace, yeah. I feel like I have more offered that would complement the nursing in as far as uh, people's health and wellness. And uh, so I'm excited. It's a great program and uh, I'm learning a lot. So pray for me, y'all that are listening and watching because it's a lot. <laughs> I'm working full time. You know, we've got a grandbaby to go see, trying to do all, school. I'm writing these papers and doing all this research. And so it's, I saw uh, her. she was studying yesterday, taking a test here. So yeah, let's, a uh, let's take a break. I think it's hard to imagine uh, for those of us that, that have been around at least since 1974, uh, that there would be a day when Roe versus Wade was overturned or at least pushed back to the States, uh, which is exactly where it should have been. And yet it's happened. And so, you know, there's a lot of groups out there, a lot of pro-life groups that are getting in position now to be able to deal with a post-Roe America. And one of those is a group called 40 Days for Life, which Lisa and I have been working with for a long time. I can definitely tell you this is a great group. Uh, they have been standing up for the unborn for a very long time. They have a peaceful prayer vigils outside abortion facilities. They have over a million volunteers in a thousand cities. And this grew out of just having one city. Uh, where they first started. So they make a big difference. Uh, 75% of the people when there's a peaceful vigil going on will have a no-show rate, which is great, uh, especially in these areas where abortion is very strong. Also, uh, because of the uh, vigils, 106 abortion businesses in America have been closed, and 45% of those uh, were in liberal states where it remains legal. So we're changing hearts. We're changing minds in the grassroots. We want to keep that up. Check out their locations, their podcasts, and their free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. They're going to keep you updated on how abortion is ending in a post-Roe America. That's four and a zero, 40daysforlife.com. Go ahead, Jay. I'm trying to find what this kale is, and I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> It's yeah, okay. Get anything. I got a Greek word. Uh, it's Greek roughage. Boy. It's a very. It's good. a superfood. Oh, it's K A L E. K A L E. Yeah. 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 Well, we made you a Greek salad. You didn't tell us what it is. It's 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 a leafy vegetable. We we and it's pretty versatile. Oh, um, I see it. Yeah, that we looks... made a Greek salad once, and he said, "I've never had that many flavors, different flavors at one time." So that's it's, you know these are all new flavors we're introducing him to. It says it's a uh, leaf cabbage. Yeah. yeah. Well, they Good just figured out a it. way to rename cabbage. Seemed like to me. I like cabbage. <laughs> it's. Del have you ever had it, Chase? Have you ever had kale? I'm sure I have. I just didn't know it was called kale. I eat it's cabbage. In, it's. It doesn't really look like cabbage, like what well, you're I'm thinking, probably. It. it looks like what those deer were eating today that were growing all <laughs> around my house. So I, I got a bunch of kale here. I think. You can yeah. make kale chips. You can put it in soups. Uh, you can put it on uh, sal in salads. It's it's great. Okay, I got it. Very good for you. No, you were saying that, uh, uh, you know, about your grandbaby. And I do remember that conversation because, you know, we when we looked at the ultrasound with Mia, we knew there was a problem. And so it caused three or four months of anxiety. And that's what was so disturbing. I mean, when... You know, when the baby was born, I remember having that conversation uh, with your kids, and they were like, "No, they were just, they were just like, no, he's, he's perfectly fine." It's like, well, what happened to all this? You know, about the brain. I mean, it just seems so surreal. And uh, I did, I wrote it, wrote it off as an answered prayer and moved on. That's exactly what it was. You know? And yeah. Missy was I mean, great because she just, she could like empathize with us i think through what we were going through at the time and she offered oh, yeah. right away to host julie's baby shower the one that we had for her down in louisiana which was great invited family which was really special 
And um, it was really good. She was just a great support person during that time because she really yeah. understood what we were going through. Oh, that's the most stressful time of my entire life was those three or four months before <clears throat> Neil was born. Because they were like, she has a problem. We just don't know what degree it is. And so, I mean, it was just, it was tough. Of course, now we, know, last night we had her her uh, 19th birthday celebration and uh, she's doing so good. We're so, so proud. I just thought, you know, what a, what a journey to go through. And now, cause uh, Missy said when she went to her college, they didn't walk 10 feet without someone said, Oh, Hey Mia. And Missy was like, how do you, how do you know all these people? And M Mia kept saying, well, those are just my friends that I met. And, but as it went on, Missy said it was quite evident that Mia had pretty well met most everyone there at, at the university because they all knew who she was. So I, I was, I was pretty, uh, proud of her and tonight they're having worship out here at the farm so a lot of her friends so i th i think that that'll be good but you know jay's on the last podcast we talked about suffering we had a gary wither all on and we were talking about how what that produces you know you see that from a biblical perspective but even what y'all are describing this morning i mean that's in its form of suffering is is the fear and worry especially about your kids and your grandkids and I even thought about it, Zach, with Jill. She had trouble uh, in pregnancy, right? I mean, she had like these health issues. It wasn't necessarily your your kids, but it was her. And, yeah. you know, she just bore the stress of that as, you know, caring a child. And I just remember how hard that was. I remember all the time we spent in prayer and, you know, just hoping nothing happened to her. But all those things typically bring about great spiritual growth, no matter what happens. You know, like in Mia's case, she had what? you know, we knew she had inside the, in, in Teddy's case, he didn't, you know, yeah, but yeah. either way it's the stress of it. And the, the stressor brings out faith and strength and prayer and all those things. Cause you don't start praying about something typically until there's some worry about it. No, it puts you in a posture where you realize you have no control. And so, yeah, I, you know, I was thinking of with Jill's situation, she had uh, congestive heart failure with, with Layla and a lot of other things. She almost died. That was pretty, pretty scary for me. And so, yeah, you, all you can do is pray because there's not really anything you can do about it or, you know, what you guys have both went through, you know, Mia's situation has been, a, well, what a journey that's been. Even uh, my sister, their daughter, when she was born, they, she didn't have a pons, which is a key part of the brain you have to have to, you know, kind of function. And uh, so they told them that she would be just a complete vegetable and if you met Peyton now, you would not even well, know that she had anything cognitively. There, there's nothing wrong with her. Um, I mean, she right. has mild things happening, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing to see what God's done. But you know, some people don't get quite that answer. But I think what it does is it does just pushes you in a posture of like, we really have a lot less control than we think we do. And it's moments like that that kind of bring that to reality. And yeah. remind us that we have a God who is in control. Absolutely. Yeah. Great follow up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a, I always call it a question of faithful prayer versus fearful prayer. It doesn't mean we're not fearing, but in, in our fear, we have faith that God's going to see us through. And so I tend to pray for myself personally that I will have the faith to be able to deal with whatever the results are. I mean, obviously, I'm going to pray for the least path of resistance. I'm like Paul, you know, hey, take this away, take this thorn away. But yeah. in faithful prayer, I'm saying, look, Lord, you know best. And so if this is my season to deal with cancer, to deal with this, to deal with that, to deal with whatever, then I, I just want to be up to the task. I want to be ready to faithfully take on whatever it is that you feel like I need to be doing. And if that's suffering, then let's do it. If, if it's blessing of healing, uh, hey, that's great, too. I mean, obviously, that's, so I feel like that's the way I try to approach it. It's Philippians me. 4, 6 is a, is a scripture that we prayed uh, a lot during that time. Uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Yeah. We held on to that word in that situation. Yeah, I love it. Well, I mean, in the first two chapters of Mark, it's pretty evident that Jesus had the power to heal diseases and cast out demons. And so in the big picture, I mean, you know, we do a lot of work with special needs kids. And, you know, if you hang around Tim Tebow for long, I mean, he's given his whole life to doing that. And you realize that 
you know, there's something, there's some way God is working in, in those kids that just brings you joy because they seem, they're just not upset. Everyone is upset around them, but the kids themselves, who you would think would just be miserable, there's some kind of joy and light that emanates from them that's hard to explain. Yeah. And uh, my point is that when you say, well, you know, God is the answer, he is the answer in all these situations because he definitely has the power to make these things right. And he definitely is not temporary or perishable. So all these things that we have to deal with in the twinkle of an eye, he will correct to whatever degree he sees fit. I mean, you, you know that these are not problems that are long term when you're dealing with a God who has the capacity to control the atoms and the molecules in our bodies. And it's just a temporary thing. That's why I have this skeleton here to remind me that without God, you basically all end up here. <laughs> Which is not cool good. T- without the cool t-shirt. Yeah. Though. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's yeah. take a break. So, Chase, you brought up an interesting thought from Mark 1 and 2 to kind of pivot us into our March study. Um, Because I've always thought, you know, we've talked a lot on the podcast in the past about the purpose of miracles, especially performed by Jesus. And, you know, it's it's not a question of of the the healing itself. It's a question of authority, you know, establishing authority of who he is in, in that moment. I think that's why he starts out with the demon possession. Uh, you know, cast out the demon and then later there's healings. And it was a really about establishing that he was who he said he was, which is m- way more well, important than someone being healed. And I know if you're that someone that doesn't seem like a reality, but it's really true. But I think that's somehow how we get the miracle in, in front of the man. I mean, is that yeah. fair to say? Well, I, I mean, I studied this half the night last night uh, because I just couldn't sleep. I was just, You know, when you get into a new book, I mean, us who are doing the podcast, it tends to, you just tend to immerse yourself into it. And here's my take on it, because it goes to what you just said, Al, and y'all can disagree or give points of reference. But because when you think about each gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they seem to center in on something a little different. I mean, if Mm -hmm. you took John, I mean, he starts off, is like Jesus is the, you know, is the word. And he kind of looks at the big picture of the word becoming flesh. I mean, he was with God in the beginning and goes from there. And you had Matthew seeming to zero in on him being the king and this connection to his heritage coming out of, you know, the Jewish heritage, and now he's, you know, king of all. And you have Luke that seems to zero in on the son of man. The human side of him tells his birth. And well, here, you know, the first verse, it's like the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the son of God. And then he 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 <laughs> tends to zero in on that aspect that this is the son of God. He He right. mentions it. You know, again, in his baptism there, he seems to be, and he's, he's, he's not giving you all the little details about his humanity. It, it just seems to immediately go to his authority and who he is and not so much about what Jesus said, but what he did. Yep. His deeds. It's just like he, it's like an action film of Jesus. Here's yep. what he did. And, Jace, and you, it leaves you no doubt that he's the son of God. Yep. Jace, to, to prove your point. It's the same way with Matthew. It started in Matthew on why he was there, but after letting them see what he could do, in Matthew is chapter 16 before this comes up, and Mark, it's eight chapters of the power of Jesus. My time has come. The kingdom of heaven is near. And, that, and the kingdom is mentioned... Uh, in the Bible about and during the in the Gospels themselves, before you get to the rest of it, the kingdom's mentioned 124, I think, times. But 
what as soon as you get to chapter eight, after seeing what Jesus could do, which was cast out demons, I mean, he he, he ruled. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Peter rebuked him for saying it, took him aside, and, and the Bible says, this is uh, Mark chapter 8, the Bible says that Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, and he rebuked Peter. <laughs> so he won the day when he said, I'm fixing to die, be buried, and raised from the dead. They're all looking around like, what in the world did he just say? So that's what Mark went. He gave you eight chapters to show you how he could say that. And they still had a hard time believing it all the way to the cross, Jace. Well, yeah. flash forward that's in our current culture, they have a hard time finding it too. They have a hard time seeing it, but it's there worldwide. I, I, I love that you mentioned that um, Matthew 16. I was thinking the same. I was thinking I was on the same track, Phil, before you, before you said that. And um, as you read Matthew 16, there's that moment. There's like the kind of the crescendo moment of, of the whole gospel of Matthew that, that you mentioned happens in eight chapters in yep. Mark. Yep. And he says, it's that moment when, when they're all sitting around and they had just got through the storm, right? Yeah, you know, the, the, where Jesus is walking on water and all that business. Um, he just called Peter the devil, and and he says, "Peter, who who do you say I am?" And that's yep. like the moment in the if you're watching a movie, this is the moment that's where it. you know all all hell's about to break loose, right? That's it. He said, "He said I, I say you're the Christ," and and then Jesus oh, says, yeah. "The the gates of of Hades will not prevail against the kingdom." I'm paraphrasing there, but in other words, if you think about a gate, a gate is a is is defensive. So what he's saying there that the, the kingdom is actually going to move forward the kingdom is going to be on the offense and is going to plow through the gates of hell and i think about what you just said there because like if you get to your image of this this is that like in tombstone when it right there's a there's a line where doc holiday says the last charge of wyatt earp and his beloved immortals right before he goes on a war path of yeah. vengeance and 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 retribution so you can imagine that the the disciples when they're hearing jesus say this they're probably getting pretty stoked up and fired up, thinking it's a, a we're, it, it's time to roll. And then the end of Matthew 16, which is what I'm preaching on Sunday, by the way, is he says something that was probably tell. completely completely deflated him. He says what? He says, if you want to be my disciple, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Yep. And that's why like the kingdom, this is the upside down <laughs> kingdom that we live in. The kingdom they thought was coming with an earthly power, but the kingdom of God came with something that was completely paradoxical to the human mind, revolutionary and changing. But like, this is a kingdom where the king is about to die, but he is going to be raised again in power. So I think that's, that's, that's the dichotomy that we're dealing with. That's why, that's why it's hard for people in Western culture to get it. Cause it's, it's, um, it's not it, we, we have we have an obsession with power. We can't fathom a power that comes from being last in line. We can't even we don't have room for that in our in our souls. For yeah. that. But that's for what three Jesus years. Hang, for three hang years. on, Dan. Hang on, Dan. Hang on. Let's take a break. <laughs> for three years, it's near. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is near. Then all of a sudden, in the middle of all that. I'm fixed to go die, be buried, and raised from the dead. Jesus talking that my time has come. When you get to the book of Acts and there's 80 mile hour winds to 100, it's like a big wind blowing. People are speaking in languages they've never studied and everybody's looking like around like what in the world is going on here? Peter gets up and preaches because he had been given the keys to the gate of the kingdom. He said, Peter, that's Matthew 16. I'm giving you the keys to the gate of the kingdom of God. And it was the gospel of Jesus that unlocks the door to the kingdom. So once that happened, you never see again, not once, from Acts chapter 2 going to the rest of the Bible. You never see that again, that it's near. The reason you don't see that it's near 
is because in Acts chapter 2, it came. So now our message is the same as the ones who, who were there to see the kingdom come. Our message is you don't need to repent because the kingdom is near. That was their message. Our message is you need to repent because the kingdom is here. That's the difference. Yeah. Well, that's my whole point was, though, Mark didn't. He just immediately went into the beginning of the gospel, and he starts with John the Baptist <laughs> as the as the forerunner yep. of and the kingdom being near. I mean, and, you know, Jesus didn't didn't do any miracles until after he was baptized and received the Holy Spirit. And that's where he starts. That's why I said he focused in on that. He he's the son of God. I mean, the other gospels we you know go through and see how Jesus you know became a man, and we've read in Hebrews he was tempted in every way, just as we are. And you see the you know the births in Matthew and Luke. And so I think if you wrap your head around that, you see why it immediately goes to his authority because here comes Jesus. I mean, you think about it, he turned the whole religious world on its head, but not that he was trying to really replace it. He was trying to infuse what he brought into what they had been doing. He was connecting the dots. So they're like, Where, where's this guy getting this authority? Because most people, you got to remember as teachers, and we've all taught in class situations, you tend to quote other people to validate what you're saying. But Jesus, his most common phrase was, verily, verily, I say to you. Well, that 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 upset the apple cart. <laughs> They're like, well, who do you think you are? Who, who are you? And so I think he makes a point of that right off the bat. And then when you get to drive, having the authority to drive out demons and then the demons knowing who Jesus is, Oh yeah. Well, they're like, what? Who? Who? Who is this guy? Who? And, and then he's going to other people saying, "Y'all follow me," not to some other religious group. He's like, "You follow me." I, I I think that was Mark's intent to get us to wrap our head around that. So when you think sure. about what he's portraying, yes, he's a human. I mean, he he has those moments. But he's also focusing in on the divine nature, his reception of the spirit and his ministry there. But it's also him being a revelation. He, he's bringing his own material, things that we've never even considered or, or contemplated. And it made me think of, you know, the only thing I can compare it to, in my opinion, I'd like to get y'all's thoughts on it. It's when John had his vision, his apocalyptic vision while he was in the spirit quotations or in the book of Revelation. And he sees Jesus, this image of who Jesus is like post-resurrection. But when you think about the qualities that he showed, I think it's like seven or eight. When he says, I saw, uh, this is Revelation 1, was that 22? says, when I turned and I saw seven golden lampstands, which represents the church, you know, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Well, we know it's talking about Jesus dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest, which, you know, represents him being mediator and priest because that's what the priests were. But it wasn't like these priests and Pharisees and, and that type. It was a, you know, is it as that he was the bridge to God? His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, which we know in who Jesus is. As why, you know, all his words were so wise from what he's saying, because the picture you're getting. And his eyes were like blazing fire. Jesus always had that ability to look through every situation and know everything about you and what's going on. And then he's like his, the sound of his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, which in their case, you just think about in these situation, the things that he's saying, it was causing chaos every time he said something because it was so powerful. In his right hand, he held seven stars, you know, which later in Revelation, it explains that they're the angels that represented 
the God, but which I think gets into this, the reason the demons knew Jesus. I mean, he's the creator of the spiritual world, angels and in that world. And then he says his face was like the sun. Uh, well, I skip one and, and held and out of his mouth came a sharp double edged sword, which you think about his message of repentance, the things Jesus would say and do would change not only the world, but change each individual life. You know, he was the teacher of the world, not just a teacher. And then his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance, which I just thought about the light and warmth that you get from the sun, but it's such power. And so I said all that to say, when you go back and when, and he records the Holy spirit descending on Jesus, like a dove, you think about the power that he had them, but also in the form of a dove, which what do you think is a gentle, is a gentle power. And so back to revelation, you know, when John saw that, when he saw him, he fell at his feet as though dead. Cause that's what we would do. I mean, Jesus's power is beyond really our, our ability to comprehend. But then you see this dove side of Jesus. Cause he, he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades to go to y'all's point, uh, Zach about the Matthew 16. Yeah. And so what, that was kind yeah. of a long dissertation, but I'm just saying he seems to, to zero in. I mean, look, Jesus is a man. He became a man. He humbled himself. He, yeah. he gen, he's gentle. He loves us, but don't ever doubt it. Jesus Christ <laughs> is the most powerful being ever to walk this it, earth. It, it, it's the, uh, it, it reminds me of the, it, uh, I, I use this a lot in the CS Lewis's Narnia. When he talks about Aslan, he's like, is he safe? And he's like, no, he's a lion, but he's good. And I think that's how we approach Jesus. But when you mentioned the son of man, um, listen to this, because that's a reference to Daniel seven. Uh, it is, right. it is a reference to Jesus, but which is also, by the way, in Matthew 16. So I, I love that Matthew 16 keep, keeps getting brought up. And to Phil's point earlier, if you think where, like, where does Phil, Phil seem like that he came out of left field, what he said, but, but it's not out of left field. It's, it's right on the money because we're talking about the kingdom here, the coming of the kingdom. Listen to this in, in uh, Daniel 7, verse 13. It says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came up to the ancient of days, who's God the Father, by the way. Jesus is uh, the son of man, God the Son. And he was presented before him, and to him, who? The son of man, was given dominion, glory, and, listen, a kingdom. He was given a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So the this reference to the hang son on, of hang man. On, Zach. Hang on, Zach. Hold that thought, and uh, let's flesh that out. We're out of time. Uh, but uh, if you want to follow us over to overtime, blaze tv.com slash unashamed, we're going to unpack that Daniel seven. Cause that's pretty rich into our discussion. So we'll see you in overtime. Thanks for listening to the unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes and for even more content that you won't get anywhere else. Subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.